So uh, what I'm wearing for today is I'm wearing a Las Vegas hat because we would have been in Vegas. And I'm wearing the Rogue Squadron Star oh, Wars jersey. That's what I should do later today. Make the kids watch Vegas videos. There you go. And yes. uh, this, this Rogue Squadron jersey I was wearing in a lot of our Disney pictures. Yeah, that was so good. So kind of, you know, remembering our last couple of holidays and looking forward to more. There, there will be more. Life's going to happen. Yeah, not this week. There's not this, not, not for a bit, but still, uh, let us get into part five of me reading. This is still in chapter two. Chapter two goes on for, uh, well, it's not that There's bad. There's a picture of you on the back of the book. I know, it's terrible, isn't it? That's an old, crabby looking picture. You look really pissy in that picture, just saying. I know. That does not look like you. I know, now I'm all. Yeah, you look really not happy. I wasn't happy when that I wrote these. That does not look like this, you. This, this picture completely describes how I felt while I was writing these you books. You look like a totally different person. That's so weird. Yeah, that was eight years ago. Yeah, that doesn't look like you. So, that's from the, the back of the book. So. It's not my Shannon. No. No. Uh, Nathan Helm's sitting at his desk trying to make a house... Out of business cards, he had he has had printed up with his name on them. With police life being as it is within the arcology, only he or Carissa need to go out at any given time. It's his turn to find something to do while he's bored. But this still beats real work any day of the week. If people would just stop asking him where the grocery and clothing stores are, he could get a lot more house building done. Much like the others around him, he knows he has a job. Uh, his his job due to Ben being his friend. He doesn't even pretend to, that he's competent or suited for his, for this work. And that's because Nathan was a guy I worked with, and he was kind of like that. He just sort of shrugged everything off. He finds Carissa's determination to do a job, a good job amusing, but he knows that handsome people such as himself aren't really built to be police officers. There are far too many things that could happen to his face, and then there goes the moneymaker. He can't risk that, and thanks to being a cop at such a facility, he knows he never has to worry about it. When he transferred to the Winnipeg Arcology... Because I got tired of writing 1237, so I wanted to write Winnipeg. Uh, it hadn't been an easy choice for him. His girlfriend had refused to go, and this meant he was basically single. Though he hadn't actually broken up with her, by leaving Earth and going to her oncology, he all but determined they would likely never see each other again. He'd been looking around at some of the young ladies in the oncology and likes some of what he sees while assuring his girlfriend back home through live video chats that he's remaining faithful in mind and body, whatever that means. Uh, he'd known Ben for years as their fathers were friends with one another and Nathan had a silver spoon in his mouth, which almost matched that which Ben possessed in his. He tried to appear more serious to the residents of the arcology than Ben did, but not by much. Donna's sitting at her desk rifling through paperwork. Nathan takes a break from his, uh, house building, uh, at work to, or house building work to flirt with her. His favorite way to pass the time. So when are we going to join the hundred mile high club? He asks. She gives him a dirty look. I have actual work to do, Nathan. I don't have time for this kind of talk. I've heard there's some odd stuff going on here out there today. So you might want to get out there and look around. It is part of your job, you know. It It is It is nice that she has paperwork a thousand years into the future. Paper's still a thing. <laughs> so there's kind of a Dunder Mifflin side to this. <laughs> Nathan laughs. What's going on out there? Did a dog pee in a non-designated area? Or be babies keeping neighbors awake at night with their crying and that leaves me to deal with it? It's an easy job, Donna. Don't play it up like it isn't. You're always so serious all the time. Real buzzkill. I can take you away from this and we can live the kind of life we're meant to since we're good looking people. Carissa comes storming in with a man in custody before Donna can respond to Nathan, a man who's fighting to get us get away from her with his wife close behind. Look, uh, John and I saw what we saw, Carissa says to the wife. I just don't believe that he pulled a knife for that reason and he keeps denying it. Why hold such a man of importance like this when he insists that this is a mistake the wife pleads what the hell happened Donna asks this man tried to kill his wife on the observation deck Carissa replies seriously uh nathan nathan says jumping up from his desk and knocking his house of cards down what the hell's wrong with you dude i did not do that this blonde eh, i'm not gonna say the word because it's uh, it's the d word uh has it in for me i'll have her badge and every one of you for bringing me here i demand the right to meet with ben woods he yells Right after you've been formally charged and thrown on a holding cell, we'll give him a call, Carissa says, while filing charges on her computer at her desk. She'd cuff the man to a steel post in the middle of the room while she does so. Uh, it isn't a high-tech holding facility they have here. We're from Sector A, Section A, the wife says. I'm Maria Cruz, 
and uh, my cousin or uh, my husband Hector is Hector Cruz. Donna says and lets out a laugh as she steps out from behind her desk. Former president of Central America, she adds. I came here to show the world that our ecology life is safe and a fun way to live, and now I'm under arrest. Maybe this needs to go to Charles Woods, Hector says angrily while fighting his handcuffs. Donna knows how this works. The ecology split along economic lines. In a move seen by many as the first sign that our ecology life will wind up the same as on Earth, the suites at the top of the ecology are larger, more lavish, and populated by important and wealthy people from Earth. The lower you go down the ecology, the lower the income of the people and have been in their homeworld. Donna's precinct is at the bottom of the ecology and thus the bottom of the food chain. Carissa stops her work as she watches Donna free Hector Cruz from the handcuffs. But I saw him try to kill his wife. You can't let him go. He has to be charged. There has to be an investigation of the matter. She protests. I know what you think you saw, Carissa, but we have certain responsibilities here beyond law enforcement. We cannot arrest a man without due process, especially a man from Section A. We can inform the police on that level about the matter, but we cannot proceed with charges here without risking a large incident with the population from up there demanding heads roll down here, Donna says, while shaking her head at what she's doing. She knows Carissa isn't lying and there's a serious matter, but it's out of her hands. Yes, we can. He had a knife. I have the weapon with his prints on it. We have security camera footage of what he did. I don't care if he ran all the Americas. He tried to kill his wife, Carissa says, moving towards Hector and Maria with a level of anger she hasn't felt since coming to the arcology. Maria steps up to Carissa and stands nose to nose with her. I understand you think you are protecting me, but I have been Hector's wife for over two. But I have been Hector's wife for over two decades. I know my husband better than you. You were in diapers when we met you. No, when we met, that's what. Yeah, I don't know why I put a you in there. There's no you in there. When we met, it's just awkward to say when we met you, and as. as meaning that Chris has some kind of a bladder leakage problem. I don't think she she ever did. And I will not allow you to ruin our lives together because of your hunches. If he says he wasn't going to use a knife on me, I believe him. He's never lied to me in the entire time we've been married. Look, ma'am, this man is lying to you right now, and you're making a big mistake here. I'm trying to look out for your safety and the safety of the people on this ship, Carissa says, not backing down. Carissa, stand down now, Donna says. Carissa glares at Donna. This is wrong, Donna, and you know it. We can't win this one, Carissa. I hate it as much as you do. Chris takes a step back, gives Maria another dirty look. I was trying to save your life. Letting me go just saved yours, Hector says with an evil smile that causes a shudder to run through both Donna and Carissa. He leads his wife by the arm out of the police station. This allows the officers to breathe. What the hell just happened there? Nathan asks. He tried to kill her, Chris says. I, I insists. I know he did, Donna says as she rushes to her desk, uses her computer to bring up the chief of police from Section A on her monitor. Kristen, there's something going on here. I need to talk to you about what happened, Krista, uh, Kristen asked, pulling her blonde hair back and tying it into a ponytail. She just arrived in work, and she's not even in uniform yet. Hector Cruz just tried to kill his wife. We have footage of the incident, but we had to let him go, Don explains. Kristen shakes her head. There's been weird stuff going on up here today. We, uh, we will get a tail on Hector. You guys have no chance of containing him with his credentials. This is the man who unified all of Central America's countries and actually made them an economic powerhouse on top of creating millions of jobs. I swear... Those are usually the worst people to deal with in this job. Thanks for the heads up. I'll let you know if anything further occurs with him. Just keep your eyes open. There's a bad feeling here today and it appears to be all over. Thank you for understanding, Donna says, and ends the conversation there. She looks over at Carissa. Sorry about that. You didn't even try to defend me there. You kissed their asses and made me look like an idiot. It's hard enough for me to get respect from people, and now that makes it worse, Carissa says. She slumps down behind her desk. She throws her badge down. I don't even know why I wear this. Everyone sees the blonde hair and the chest, and they don't see me as an authority figure at all. I need some support here, or I might as well quit now. That was pretty cold, Nathan says, before he resumes building things out of business cards. Donna shakes her head at Nathan. I'm afraid you're you're going out there with Carissa. You heard Kristen. There's weird stuff going on out there. You guys are going to be active patrol looking to see what the hell's going on. If it's all over the ship, and with rumors as they are, we'd better keep our eyes open. Maybe ask that John guy from the observation deck. He moved fast to stop Hector from killing his wife. There's no way he doesn't have special training, Carissa says. Special ops? I heard rumors there were they were interested in arcology matters, Nathan speculates. Carissa nods. I'd be willing to bet on it. So we go to the next, next scene. Yeah. All right. Hector Cruz boards the elevator and looks over at his wife. He is still enraged at the police for having the nerve to bring him in like that. He's a man who united a subcontinent. It's bad enough he has to live caged in a box for the rest of his natural life, and now authorities are trying to rob him of his dignity and his reputation as a good and peaceful man. Central American countries were fortunate as the world continued to populate at an alarming rate. 
in that they were aware of this issue and actually instituted population controls within the borders of Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. They actually charged incredible fees to people wanting to immigrate when the world started filling up, and the decision was made to meld all of the smaller countries into one superpower nation simply called Central America and under the leadership of self-made billionaire Hector Cruz. Hector had been in charge of the new country for 12 years before he'd voted... He was voted out in favor of a younger man with a new vision, and the younger man was spearheading the movement of humans into space on these arcologies, and suggested this move to Hector shortly before taking over the country that Hector himself had worked to mold. He'd been willing to go, but he resented the new leader for sending him away like that. He'd expected life in orbit to be so much more than it is. As he rides the elevator to level 53 within the state within Station A, within Section A, sorry, he thinks about his reservations to this move. He thinks about wanting to move to Europe and live in the Alps. He thinks about how much he misses rivers, sunrises, birds, rain, and other parts of everyday life one takes for granted until they live in an elaborate tin can in space. He would give almost anything to step out into, day, into a day of sunshine and fresh air. There are thoughts raging inside Hector's mind that he is blaming on the confines of his surroundings. He knows he held the knife up that the thought of ending a life was to end his own misery, but he doesn't know why. His mind cannot maintain clarity long enough for him to focus on what he needs to do in order to make the right decision here. He cannot recall if he wanted to kill Maria, himself, or perhaps a passerby who made him angry in that moment. The politi political figure he was would never have wielded a knife and certainly never would have lied about it. He would also have never tried to use who he is to gain political favors for anyone, no matter where they were perceived to be in the social hierarchy. He knows there's a war taking place inside his mind, and something won't allow him to express the truth at this time. He chalks this up as space madness he had heard rumors about on Earth long before he came here. He had brushed these rumors off as paranoid delusions by those that always feared the unknown. There's rage deep beneath. It's always been there, of course. Everyone has that voice in the back of their mind telling them to do evil but most are able to fight against it and lead what is considered to be a normal life. It's that which makes mankind civilized. Hector's internal war has always been easy to win on for rationality, but something has changed in the prison he lives in, both physical, is a both physical and mental one, wrapped into a tangled mess within his psyche. He watches Maria as she runs her fingers through her hair, chews her nails, and hums to herself. He hates that hum. He's listened to that hum for over 20 years, as her voice has gone from that of a nightingale to that of a dying crow hanging from live electrical wires while being cooked on the inside. May not, may not like her hum a whole lot. Maybe. Maybe not. Is that the hum that caused, is it the hum that caused the knife to be raised? Had he meant to kill her in that moment? He hates her chewing her nails. What a filthy habit that is. She didn't do that when they were dating. That little secret was revealed after they walked down the aisle and nail chewing was hardly a reason for him to part with half of his fortune in a divorce. Maybe more, considering they had three kids. Their children had been raised well by the two of them, but since the kids left, something had always seemed rather off between them. They weren't the friends they once were, and were some unspoken doubt in their minds as to whether or not they could get back that which they had lost. Their kids had been a good buffer, a good distraction from what was a dissolving friendship and a lost attraction to one another. What was I trying to say in this book? What in the world was I trying to say in this book? Holy crap. Man, there are so many cries for help from myself in this book. Uh, though he hadn't been a corrupt politician, uh, Hector did have affairs. He always suspected Maria knew about that, but wasn't likely to protest too long as she got to live in the life of luxury she was used to. Maybe Maria's just waiting until Hector dies and then she could bring another man out into the light and expose herself as a cheater as well. If that's the case, maybe Hector should kill her now. She wouldn't expect to be strangled in an elevator any more than she expect to be stabbed on the lower decks of the ship. The elevator reaches level 53 and the doors open. Maria steps out moments before Hector would have tried strangling her to death. He falls back against the wall of the elevator and catches his breath, trying to hold the rage inside. The rational side of him is still there, but it's losing the battle minute by minute. Come, my love, she says to him. Let's put this day behind us in our quarters, she suggests. Hector lets out a breath and nods. Maybe sleep will help me here. I don't feel like myself today, my love. He winks at her, but it's followed by a scowl as soon as she turns the other way and starts walking to their place. He even hates the sound of her footsteps right now as the anger grows. He takes deep deep breaths as he follows her, suppressing the rage as well as he can, but the voice is getting louder with every step. Maria stops at her door and holds, holds her hand against it. The beep is heard as her handprint is recognized. The door opens. Maria steps inside, Hector close behind. His fists are clenched and his voice 
The voice is screaming at him. There's only one thing that will make the voice stop. Section A doesn't have any cameras inside the quarters of the residence. In this case, that's a terrible error. Hector waits for the door of their quarters to close and then proceeds to take extreme, extreme action in order to calm the rage, ending Maria's life as violently as he can. I'm sorry. Why am I a weirdo? Because I wrote it? Uh-huh. Oh, my nose is so cold. Do you want one more scene, or is that it? How long? 15 minutes. I'd do one more. One more? Yeah. Okay. So, Kristen was a character that I parachuted in from old books I wrote. Um, I wrote So, I wrote the science fiction series for Into the Void, and then I wrote a, a thriller series, which started with a book called Mirrors, and it went to all this other stuff, and it... it was really really weird i even had like a shadow walkers book i tried to write which was about these kind of human characters that kind of weren't and it was all this weird genetic experiment that went awry and so Kristen was a character from those books that i kind of parachuted into these because i thought okay we we need Kristen in this because this is going to be kind of a horror sci-fi so i'm gonna throw her in because i always liked her character uh, Kristen, Burns, Kristen Burns' position within the Sector A police force was earned through five years of exceptional work as a military soldier manning the line between Jewish and Arab settlers in one of the many overpopulated disputed zones during the population crisis. Yeah, they still don't get along. Uh, I I looked at, I thought about, I thought, you know what, they're still not going to get along in a, in a millennia. I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, she had managed to defuse many tense standoffs and had actually taken a bullet on two occasions. She had a reputation as being a lot tougher than her blonde hair and green eyes would leave one to believe. She had been raised in a military family and always managed to keep herself in top physical shape. This job had been offered to her by Charles Woods as a thank you for years of service to her people and for her bravery. She's a little more suitable for this job than, than the other bumbling fools on the lower levels. Uh, in her early 30s, Kristen nevertheless considered this as the first stage of her retirement. She was wealthy enough not to work, and she was smart with her money, so she lived off the interest she collected her in the bank, instead of spending it wildly, as many are, are apt to do. Prided both for her physical ability and for her intelligence, she finds herself in an internal battle right now. She knows deep down that something here is wrong. She knows that people are not behaving as they should. A job that was easy a week ago has become an actual job. An alarm sounds... And Kristen points to two of her offers, officers. Nikki, Matt, you guys stay here. I'm answering that call. What is it, Matt asks. Personal alarm from level 53, Kristen asks as she reaches into her desk and grabs her gun. Protocol says you don't you do not do this alone, Nikki says. Kristen nods. We don't have enough officers to assign two of you to this, two of us to this. There's too much crap going down right now, and I need both of you to be awaiting the next call. We both know it's going to be coming. We are woefully understaffed. At least most of the stuff we've been seeing is just typical domestic disputes, Matt says in an effort to alleviate some of the growing stress. But it's growing more violent by the hour, Matt. Whatever is going on here is gaining steam as the hours pass, and we are helpless to stop it, she says as she heads out into the main hallway and then to the elevator. She makes a short trip from level 55 to 53, then rushes off to the elevator, off the elevator into crowds of people on her way to, to a private quarters. This is a level of stress to the, there is a level of stress to this that she hates. These are all innocent people and good people. They all passed aggressive psychological testing and were considered some of the best people left on the planet and assigned to Section A, which meant that they are pampered more than the other residents. These people had less reason to be snapping than those on the lower levels, and yet, here they are snapping badly. And Kristen had the task of figuring out what was happening before it got worse and turned deadly for those unable to accept bad situations. There were precious few places to hide here anyways. The rumors about Arcology 443 have been cir circling this one as well. Kristen had heard, heard them and, as much as she'd like to brush them off, things here are going the same way as they did there. Kristen knows that they were not staffed with enough officers to deal with riots, should it reach that point. She has to focus on the task at hand, though. There's enough danger in this ship without speculating on what might happen or could happen. Kristen reaches the room in question and draws out her security guard and card and scans it against the door. It allows her to bypass hand verification. It beeps as it accepts her identification and the door slides open. Kristen sees no one and lights her off. Lights, she commands, but the room remains dark. Crap, she says, and she draws her weapon. She hates drawing her weapon like it's like this, since there's a good chance she'll need to use it. As she steps inside, the door closes behind her. 
She looks in, She looks towards the bathroom and sees the doors closed. Appears the light in there is on. She decides to try to talk her way out of it. Officer Burr in Section APD. I was brought here by a personal alarm in this room. Please state the emergency for now. As suspected, there's no answer. She pauses and looks towards the other room. The other areas of the room. There isn't an area where she can see someone might be hiding, so they have to be in the bathroom. I need to know everything here is clear that there's no danger present in, the, present in the residence. She shakes her head and presses a button on her belt, which will signal her partners she requires backup. So that does away with you guys need to stay here, because, yeah. She makes her way slowly towards the bathroom. She has a security guard out again. Her gun is armed and ready to fire. Sweat runs down her cheek, and, she, and, and I remember how this scene ends, and I'm going to skip over parts of it, because... Yeah, it's, it's pretty nasty. Uh, the darkness inside the room seems to be growing in depth as she gets closer to the bathroom. She scans her card and door, door beeps before opening. There's no one inside the bathroom. She enters the room, even draws back the shower door and finds no one inside. She's at a loss to explain this until she sees a figure falling from the ceiling. This is a rookie mistake. People, as a general rule, don't look up as they're, and, and she has committed this sin, not spotting the missing ceiling tile or the man who is lying in wait there until she pa passed by to make a move. She turns and takes a hard strike to the side of the head from what she believes is a baseball bat. She falls backward, and the back of her head hits the bathroom door, the room spinning as she collapses to the floor. Kristen fires a shot at a blurry figure while her vision struggles to recover and her aim is off. The laser blast hits the ceiling instead and pieces of ceiling tire, tile are vaporized while the figure kicks Kristen in the ribs and then kicks her in the head. A man kneels over and pins her th throat to, her f to the floor um, with her arm. You think you're taking me in? Do you know who I am? Kristen can't see him, but she knows the voice. Hector Cruz? She forced me into this position. It all started in Section C and led here. I'm a damned hero. I will not be treated like a common criminal. Now I'm going to do to you what I should have done to that cop in Section C. And then it just it just, it just, just gets kind of ugly from there. It just, yeah. It gets kind of kind of ugly. Yeah. Da, da, da. <laughs> You're, I'm sorry. I'm just skipping over that because it gets kind of, kind of. I I was in a dark place. Uh, Hector laughs. It's not him. Kristen's talked about, uh, talked with Hector and made him laugh many occasions. This deep, menacing, primeval laugh is not his because he he attacks her. He physically attacks her. It's really kind of gross. Uh, this is a beep. At, there's a beep at the door. Hector rushes out of the bathroom on a dead run as the door slowly slides open. Officer Matt Davidson sees the man running at him and fires. Another shot rings out as Nikki Randall fires from outside of Victor, Hector's view. Uh, Hector's torn in half by the laser blasts when they hit him. His torso is vaporized while his legs fall to the floor and forward momentum propels his chest, arms, and head into the hallway at Nikki's feet. Yeah. So they just vaporize the middle of him. Yeah. Sorry. Kristen, you okay? Nikki shouts. That's not the most violent weapon in the book, though. Uh, Kristen, you okay? Nikki shouts into the room while grabbing, while kicking the half corpse away from her. Uh, Matt rushes over to Kristen and grabs a towel to wrap her up. He then turns to Nikki. She needs a medic. Kristen turns to Matt, spitting blood on the floor again before she speaks. His wife's body's hidden in here somewhere. He disabled the lights. Thanks for showing up. Nikki calls the medics while trying to come to grips with what just happened here. For them, the horror has just begun. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. yeah, that's a cliffhanger, sort of. Kind of. I should put my hand on my face, but you think about it, and then you go, and then it's itchy, and you gotta. So, like you're doing right now. Yep. I touch my face a lot. I know I do too. All right, so there you go. That's uh, that's that's part five of me me reading this, and I apologize for Hector, but he's dead now. So it's it's kind of a, kind of a rule in my books that if if I find a character kind of like repugnant. They, they have to die. It's kind of a rule. Okay, you went too far. Yeah, you're dead. Because that's that's too far. Some some villains you can reclaim, but it's not often. My book says just, yeah, it's, they got to die. But I also, uh, what I try to do is make sure that some of the heroic characters are, are killed in the books too. Because sometimes when you're watching a movie, you're like, okay, so that's a group of people that live. Right. And it's kind of hard to take any kind of fear that somebody might get killed off right. in this situation you're like well none of them are gonna die so i try to make sure that people don't feel that comfortable they're like they're not gonna die here are they and then oh he killed that person off so there you go you guys are all caught up on chapters one and two we're now into chapter see chapter three
On page 21, as I'm putting my wife to sleep. No. All right. There you go. Thanks for watching. Uh, stay, stay safe, everybody. And uh, I'm guessing this center ice page that shows there's no <laughs> games on right now, it's going to be like that for a while. A, a while. So oh, wow. between now and when that actually shows some form of hockey of my, some sort. My phone's still telling me what games are supposed to be today, though. So. It's weird because it says postponed right over it. I know. Jets and Canucks, Islanders and Penguins. And I didn't simulate or, like, speculate about who would have won what games because then it still would have been. You're biased because you're thinking this. Team, nah, I don't need that today. So, <laughs> All right. Thanks for watching. I will continue this. And, uh... Do hit like and subscribe if you're browsing your way through. Probably from the Hockey Channel. Looking for something to, to occupy time. And this works. And uh, it's uh, oddly similar to some things that we see going on. Because it's it's viral. I will say it's, it's viral that's going on in this book. It's kind of a 28 days later kind of viral. But it's still there. Alright, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you again soon.